Hi, I'm Michael, and I wanted to do a video about the stuff that I was warned about before owning an electric car, and how it's panned out in reality. So we traded our diesel car for this, a Hyundai Ioniq 5. Now, this video isn't about the specifics of this car, which I might add is a good car with some wonderful features. <laughs> I mean, it's not quite a great car, such as the odd lack of rear wiper. Why? And it's frustrating soundtrack. Anyway, this video is about what people warned me about before owning an electric car and what my actual experience has been like. Okay, so number one, you're always going to be worried about range. It's the first question I always get asked when people find out that my car is fully electric. What's the range? And my answer is usually something like, uh, it depends, because it does depend. It depends on loads of factors, such as temperature, weather, type of driving, average speed, things like that. But for this car, the advertised range is 230 miles, and I've been able to get anything from 125 to 230 miles from a single charge. Yeah, that is quite a big um, range of ranges. However, even with this vast range of ranges, honestly, I very rarely worry about range. Why? Well, it's because I just don't often drive all that far all that very often. And in the UK at least, this looks to be pretty typical. So in the UK's 2021 census, people were asked about how far their commutes are to work. And the vast majority of UK residents said that they commuted 30 kilometers or about 18 and a half miles or less to work. So with a bit of maths, with an occasional detour, let's call it 50 miles a day round trip. If you can charge your car every day, and that of course is a big if, more on that later, even with a Fiat 500e, the car with the lowest estimated range for sale here in the UK of about 85 miles, the average Brit would still be able to get to and from work. If we halved that in the winter, you'd probably be cutting it fine, but you'd still be able to do it. All this is to say that the vast majority of people aren't driving 100 to 200 miles a day, me included. So yeah, worrying about range was something I thought would be a bigger part of being an EV owner, but for me, it just isn't really. Okay, so number two, you're going to be spending most of your time waiting for your car to charge. This one is all about home charging. So filling an internal combustion engine car, well, it's a breeze, isn't it? You just pop to the petrol station anytime your fuel gets low and filling up takes five, maybe 10 minutes if the pump is running slow and that's it. It's really easy and you probably only have to do it once a week, maybe once a month if you're not driving all that far. But an electric car, yeah, electric cars are a bit different. You'll be filling up your car more regularly, maybe once a day, and it can take ages. Eight, 10, 14 hours for a full charge isn't all that uncommon, although it's worth saying, a public rapid charger can be much faster, but we'll talk a bit more on those later. So my car, the Hyundai Ioniq 5 standard range has a 54 kilowatt hour battery. And actually, hang on, let's just do a quick lesson on terminology around batteries and power. So power is measured in watts and it's a measure of how much power something needs to do the thing that it's designed to do. So for example, a thousand watts or one kilowatt is approximately how much power a microwave or iron uses to do the thing that it's designed to do. So a car's battery capacity, i.e. the size of its fuel tank, is measured in kilowatt hours. So think of a kilowatt hour being the electricity equivalent of a litre or gallon of fuel. A kilowatt hour is a unit of energy to describe how much power a thing consumes over time. So in the same way that you'd have a say 100 litre or 25 gallon fuel tank, this car has a 54 kilowatt hour battery. So if you're using a one kilowatt microwave at full power, i.e. constantly using one kilowatt of energy for an hour, it would use one kilowatt hour of energy. Or if you're using say a four kilowatt heater on full power for 15 minutes, it would also use one kilowatt hour of energy. 
this is how your energy company will charge you for the energy that you use at home. It's what your home electricity meter will measure and it's what will appear on your electricity bill, or at least that's what it does here in the UK. A typical UK house uses about eight to 10 kilowatt hours of energy per day. So my fairly typical 54 kilowatt hour battery that's in this car by comparison is a huge amount of energy. Right, back to charging. So yeah, compared to internal combustion engines, it can be a bit of a faff to charge, but that's only if you think of it like an internal combustion engine car. So for me, there are two big differences here. Firstly, the ability to charge it at home or at a friend's house or really anywhere where there's electricity. And two, the way you charge. The big difference here being that rather than waiting until your tank is empty with an electric car, and assuming you have the ability to, you can just plug it in every night to top up your battery. So here's the way that I think about it. Compared to my previous internal combustion engine car, I now have a very slow but personal petrol station at home for a car that has a much, much smaller fuel tank. So whilst there are admittedly some downsides which require a bit of extra thought, more on that later, there are some massive upsides, like the fact that my car refuels at night when I'm asleep. It's always full in the morning after charging. I know exactly how much it's going to cost to fill up. I can take advantage of those cheap off-peak electricity tariffs. I'll never have to queue for my home charger and I can generate my own fuel using solar panels, which is pretty cool. Now, it's worth mentioning that I know not everyone has the means, the space, or the ability to be able to put in a home car charger, but this is where public charging will need to step up and fill the gap. And on-street charging will need to become way more widespread. But of course, you can charge at so-called destination chargers while you're doing something else, e.g at the supermarket or shopping center, workplace, hotels, etc. Even a friend's house or family member's house, all you need is, an, is electricity and a three pin plug. Because you don't actually need one of those expensive home chargers. Most cars come with what's called a granny charger that plugs into a three pin socket. Granny chargers, yeah, well, they are the slowest way to charge, but for most people, it will give them more than enough energy if plugged in overnight. Here's a great video that goes into lots more detail on this. Well, I am getting very wet. So to summarize, whilst it does require a bit of a mental shift when it comes to filling up your car because it's slower and obviously takes a bit longer, once I got into the habit of just plugging the car in at night, it was something I forgot about very, very quickly and it just became pretty easy. Okay then, number three. Long car journeys are impossible with electric cars. Now, so far, I've done a few longish trips and two properly long trips over four hours where one or two charge stops were needed just to get to my destination. And the big takeaway was that long car journeys are absolutely doable, but with a few caveats. So there are a few things to unpack here. Number of chargers, charging speeds and the need to plan. So first let's cover the number of charges. As of April 2023, there are about 40,000 public EV chargers and about 400,000 home EV chargers with close to a million fully electric cars on UK roads. It's no wonder people are worried that we're gonna be running out of chargers. But with this in mind, in my experience, here in the UK, if you just stick to the motorways and major roads and do your research beforehand, there are plenty of chargers to go around. Now, did they always work? Nope. Did I sometimes have to wait for a charger to be free? Yes. Do we need more chargers here in the UK? Yep, absolutely. But in general, I didn't have to wait long or travel that far to get to the next charger. It just really wasn't that big of a deal. Now, I suspect the reason is that chargers are getting faster. Not everyone is charging all the time, and most people will charge at home where it's cheaper. Unlike internal combustion engine cars, where you 
have to pretty much go to a petrol station if you want to fill up. So, charging speed, and on long trips, it's all about the rapid chargers. As mentioned earlier, the vast majority of charging that I do, and I do totally understand it's a privilege, is at home, which means I only use public chargers when I'm driving long distances. Now, not all chargers are made equal, and when you're driving long distances, you will absolutely need to use one of these, a rapid charger. Now, rapid chargers are chargers that allow you to charge your car really, really quickly compared to a normal home charger. Home chargers tend to be 3.5 kilowatts for a granny charger or 7.4 kilowatts for an installed home charger. Rapid chargers can be anything from 25 to 50, such as this one, all the way to 350 kilowatts. Now, these are all just numbers, but what it really means is that with the fastest chargers and in the right conditions, some cars can charge from zero to 100% in about 20 minutes. 20 minutes is still slower than a petrol pump, so this does mean that a quick splash and dash isn't really possible. But for us, as we're usually carrying our small human, stopping every two hours for a toilet stop, quick snack and leg stretch is, is pretty normal anyway. And once you've done that, it's almost certainly gonna be enough time to get a good charge. We've actually had a, a few occasions where the car's finished charging before we've been ready to head off. And also, sometimes you'll end up charging somewhere unexpected and off the beaten track, which is, which is quite fun. And finally, there's the need to plan. I'm going to cover the app landscape next, but a smartphone is a vital piece of equipment for driving long distances in an electric car. You will need to plan the most efficient route, find chargers, and you'll often need to use a smartphone just to pay and start a charge. Planning is vital to get into your destination as quickly as possible. So could you just jump in the car and pull over at a big service station when your battery is running a bit low? Yeah, absolutely. But if you want to get to your destination as quickly as possible, a bit of planning is needed to know which is the most efficient and fastest route to take. So in summary, with a bit of planning, I found that there are more than enough chargers to go around. And even if you get to one that's full, well, you probably won't have to wait all that long to get a charge. And even if you do, waiting for a charge isn't that taxing if you find somewhere nice to stop. Right, finally, there are so many apps, it is so confusing. Okay, I have to admit, this one, unfortunately, is absolutely spot on. The app landscape for electric cars is a complete, confusing, overwhelming, and frankly, stupid mess. The apps broadly fit into one of three categories, charging apps, navigation apps, and utility apps. So charging apps are, they're the biggest bugbear of mine. So currently there are lots and lots of different providers of public electric chargers, and the vast majority of them have their own app, which you need to download before you can charge your car. Which, <laughs> of course, is ideal when you're in the middle of nowhere and you've got rubbish signal. This is thankfully getting better for two good reasons. Number one, the UK government has mandated that the vast majority of public charge points must offer contactless payment from November 2024. And number two, a few companies are creating a single platform and therefore single payment system where you can do away with multiple apps for each charging company and just use one, which is great. Now, my favorite is an app called Octopus Electroverse, <clears throat> affiliate link here below, uh, which is genuinely one of my go-to apps now for longer journeys. ZapMap and PlugShare also kind of do this, but it's nowhere near as polished as the Electroverse app. Now, all this info will probably be out of date in the next six months, as this space seems to be changing pretty rapidly. Thank goodness. Okay, let's talk navigation apps. Now, these apps aren't just about getting you from point A to point B. They need to do so whilst telling you where you need to stop and charge, for how long, and what route is the most efficient. So the big daddy in the world of electric car navigation is an app called A Better Route Planner, or ABRP for short. Others try, ZapMap, Octopus Electroverse, Google Maps, PlugShare, Waze to some extent, 
but none of them come close to the granularity and features of a better route planner. It allows you to plan a route, plan charging stops, add waypoints, add efficiency targets, set preferred charges. It's so wonderfully nerdy, which is great for someone like me, but not so great for those who just want to get in the car and have a drive. Although I do suspect that that sort of app will eventually come. And it's worth saying that most in-car navigation systems, this one included, are rubbish at this, except for Tesla. I've heard that Tesla's is pretty exceptional. Okay, utility apps. So by this, I mean things like the car's own app. Uh, Hyundai's is inexplicably called Blue Link for whatever reason, and it's just okay. Uh, as well as a few other useful apps to help making the owning of an electric car a little bit easier, such as the previously mentioned Zap Map and PlugShare, uh, which is, they're so useful for finding uh, charging points. And there's also a really cool app called Kilowatt, which tells you just how long it will take you to charge your car based on your car and how much um, battery you have left. So yeah, annoyingly, there's not yet one app to rule them all, but I do think it's coming. At the moment, you'll need a folder just for apps, which is a pain right now. But I do think once car manufacturers up their game and sort their navigation systems and integration with the charging networks out, this problem will quickly be sorted. Uh, did I miss any apps out? Do let me know if I did in the comments. So to summarize, you're always gonna be worried about range. For me, not really. You're gonna be spending most of your time waiting for your car to charge. Yeah, sort of, but for me, I'm mostly asleep when it happens. Long car journeys are impossible with electric cars. Mm, not really, particularly if you don't mind a bit of extra planning and a bit of extra waiting. There are so many apps, it's so confusing. Uh, yeah. Okay then, that is it from me for this video. Hopefully it's been helpful in some way. Do let me know if you agree or disagree with anything in the comments below and hopefully I'll see you next time for the next video.